March 2020, two men agreed to settle a dispute in an arranged fight at a remote beauty spot in Cornwall. What was supposed to be a one-on-one -on -one fight would end in a brutal assault on a vulnerable young father of one, who would be left for dead, both by his attackers and by those he thought were his friends. This is what happens when a dispute turns deadly. This is the murder of Callum Hill. Thank you for joining me today, my lovelies. I hope you are well, hope life is good. The case I'm gonna be covering today is one that means a great deal. I've worked with a family on this. Actually, quite a few of the ones that you'll be seeing and you will have seen recently I've worked with families on and it's so powerful for me to be able to tell their stories because it's very challenging when you lose somebody and you feel that you don't have a voice, the press report in a certain way, People have their own assumptions to make and tiny aspects of a human being can be amplified to such volume that it drowns out the reality of who they were. I really appreciate every single one of you who comes here on a regular basis. If you are new here, I release my crime content on a Wednesday and a Sunday. My catchphrase is crime and consistency. If you like that, get your notifications on and subscribe. It's so nice seeing new members. Also, for those of you who support me on Patreon and my YouTube membership, thank you. I've got loads coming out on those platforms, but also, as you know, I would not be able to do this without you. I really wouldn't. Today's case, as I said, is about 22-year-old Callum Hill. So who was Callum? First of all, he was an individual who was still living at home. He lived with his mum. Julie Cox and his older sister, Sabrina. They lived in Liam in Plymouth. They are a large, close-knit family. So this is a very connected family. So in addition to Sabrina, Callum had four of the siblings. He had brothers Mike, Matthew, Kyle and Tyler. Now Sabrina, she was 14 years older than Callum, and to some degree I would say that as far as them being siblings, there was also this other side where there was almost a maternal relationship with him, deeply cares about her brother, and clearly that age gap would mean that she would have been highly protective of him, and indeed she looked after him all the time when he was little, and that clearly amplifies those kind of really close relations within families. Another thing about Callum, so he was vulnerable. He'd suffered brain damage when he was born and that brain damage eventuated in him having some significant special needs. And this was genuinely on a mental level. He remained really young. So developmentally, he always had, what would we say, a very childlike understanding of the world around him. And it's important that you hang on to this information as ever. You know how I am, guys. I like to point things out early so you can connect the dots. But when somebody has a developmentally younger age for their years, there are fragilities and vulnerabilities within their personality that are going to open. And they're going to open for a very clear reason. Naivety is not that helpful as you get older. Because when you apply logic to the world, you apply it at the age that you are, and that's why we understand that children act differently to adults. That's why my children, when they were very young, didn't, I don't know, make me three course meals, drive me to work and look after the garden using heavy equipment. We know children don't have that understanding of the world and it would be dangerous to me also if they'd done any of those things. So when you are looking at a human being and they may appear completely normal, 
When you look at them visually, they may seem like a grown adult. They may even speak and you will comprehend them as that person because your bias is, well, this person seems to be making sense to a certain age, they look a certain age. But if there is a developmental issue, it challenges and changes the perception of the world and it challenges and changes the perception of the activities that you may engage in within that world. One of the things that the family said was that Callum was one of those children that would just follow his mum around and even as an adult he would just remain incredibly close but incredibly naive in that way and one of the things that he would love to do and I can completely understand this because I think when we are children we form soothing habits and one of the things that Callum would really love is if his mum would smooth his hair so that's what he'd get her to do. And again, we're seeing this really close connection and this childlike behavior. So this is vulnerability, very easily led and incredibly eager to impress. And any of you out there, we've all done it. I appreciate it. I was a teenager once, it was a long time ago. Although my clothes still reflects the actual outfits that I wore as a teenager. I literally look exactly the same now just a much older and more lined version. But the reality is that when you're a teen, you want to stand out, you want to belong, you want to have connections, you want to be cool. These are all things that most people accept as a part of growing up. Most of us never achieved them. I was none of those things really, but I always wanted it. And so when you get the opportunity to belong, it has meaning. Think about gang culture. I've worked a lot in gang culture and gang dissemination and helping young men in particular, although young girls were involved, to stay away from getting involved in that kind of mentality, mindset and organisation. I will cover some gang violence. I've worked on quite a few murder cases within gang violence and I understand it well. And I don't patronise with the ridiculous platitudes as if these young men and women are really evil, going around, hanging out, stealing things and causing trouble because they're just bad. You know, actually the truth is most of them haven't had the best primary figures in their lives and role models and the consequences are they want to belong somewhere and gangs offer them that opportunity. So even when kids could have a level of academic intellect, capability, etc. If they're in a certain environment where they don't have the markers that would give them a life of meaning, they'll find ways to make themselves mean. And gangs do that. That's why members become within that kind of facet. Now, with Callum, he's got a really close family. He's got lots of those lovely foundations. That thread of vulnerability, it is going to cause problems when it comes down to his relationships with other people and where that takes him. Now, when he's 17, he actually gets into a situation with his girlfriend where they fall pregnant and they later go on and she gives birth to a really healthy baby boy. They were really young, let's be honest. 17 is young, but they were very much in love and actually they stayed together. So they worked through the fact that they were dealing with a new challenge and they were dealing with a situation that would have felt incredibly foreign because suddenly you're a father and a mother. But they did that and he absolutely loved that little boy. And the fact that they, in spite of all of the realities of being young parents and the problems that can create, staying together suggests that they really wanted to do the best for their son. How did the family describe Callum? Well, they described him as happy, loud, really full of life. Apparently he would really enjoy doing things like going to the beach and he loved family trips to the moors. They said that his connection with water was one of those things that just reflected that childlike form within him. So he was always jumping into water, even when it was freezing. I appreciate that some people do the Wim Hof method where they literally immerse themselves in ice water. It looks good. I know people who do it. They have great skin. I'm just saying I'm more of a heated throw kind of person or hot tub, hot being the operative word. But like I said, what they're getting across about Callum is that even when the water was absolutely freezing and most of us would just be wanting a coffee from a flask, he was just in there. On the last family holiday, 
that Callum enjoyed, Sabrina and him actually went ahead and had a fish pedicure together. Sure that some of you are like, what? Is that? What's that? A fish pedicure? And no, for those of you who don't know, it's not walking in somewhere, sitting down, and the fish gives you a pedicure with like, I don't know, nail varnish in a file. But I'm joking, obviously. It would be amazing if they did. I imagine it would need to be like a large tuna, maybe a dolphin, even though that's a mammal. You know what I'm going with. But those fish pedicures are where you put your feet in these tanks and all the fish eat the bits of dead skin off your toes. But again, what does that say about him? The fact that he's with his sister doing something that she's enjoying, quite a feminine reality there and that connection. That connection's really clear. He loved animals as well. So his family say that one of the things that he became really attached to was this stray cat. I am obsessed with animals. You cannot walk into my house without wondering whether I am an animal hoarder. But again, I genuinely feel that people who've got that connection with other sentient beings, it says something deeply compassionate about who they are. And the fact that Callum just takes time to look after this stray, again, reflects something both childlike, but also compassionate within him. The family talk about the fact that they spent a huge amount of time together. They'd enjoyed trips to the coastal town of Loo in Cornwall. And they'd often have takeaways together. They watched movies together. And one of the things they apparently like doing as a family, something that I relate to, and all of you listening to me will relate to this because don't pretend you don't watch horrors. I know you watch horrors. We just like putting ourselves in scary situations and Callum and his family were very much alike that. They enjoyed scaring themselves, they enjoyed watching thrillers. And one of the memories that both Callum's mum and also his sister has is that he would literally drag his mum around Plymouth and he would always insist that they go shopping for his favourite foods. He was also a big prankster. This is where me and Callum really relate to each other. There isn't a cupboard in my home that I haven't squoze myself into just to throw myself out at a highly inappropriate moment to terrify either my children or my partner. Pranks are great fun. We should do more of them. But this is something, again, that reflects that childlike quality. Sabrina actually recalled so many occasions where he'd hide behind a door and just jump out at her to scare her. And the last time that he did that, she was actually carrying a cup of coffee, which is where pranks can become problematic. <laughs> I am one of those individuals who has caused similar scenarios to unfold, and we do appreciate that a prank should never involve, I don't know, first degree burns, but nonetheless, you can kind of see that fun the antics of an individual just kind of hiding there thinking I'm really going to scare somebody that I love and it's going to be so funny to watch their face. But the last time that he did that, Sabrina had no idea that it would be the last joke he ever played on her. He never got another chance to hide behind a door. He never got another chance to prank the family. He never got another chance to go and have a pedicure with his sister. He never had a chance to jump into the freezing water or to visit the seaside. But like any of these sliding doors moments, none of us know. None of us know when it's going to be the last time. None of us know when it's going to be the last moment. None of us know when it's the last goodbye. It's one of the most painful parts of being human. But when we're talking about traumatic deaths, I think it's so significant what we would do for just another second in their sight. Now, before I get into the actual story itself, and as ever, you know, it's an incredibly harrowing one. I want you to be aware that the family admit that Callum was no angel during his life. For example, he'd gone through a phase of dealing drugs and it actually put him into a position where he entered this underground world, so to speak, and it almost cost him his life. You know that I've covered other cases where we talk about people who've been horrifically tortured and murdered and they were involved in drugs. And to make it clear, I will always stay true to the reality that a life is precious. It's a life. There is no right for anybody because of anybody's activities in these circumstances to value it lesser than. The same when we're talking about sex workers, individuals who are precious beings to the people that they love. 
we're talking about a father today as well. So the family don't shy away from the fact that there are certain elements of Callum's life that if he could do again, he would do again. Because there is a regrettable element to the reality of what entails. And maybe this story would not be told in the way it's being told if that hadn't occurred. When he got involved as a dealer, there were some really heavy consequences physically to him. So in June 2018, he actually got stabbed in the chest with a kitchen knife. He was stabbed by a man called 25-year-old Leon Brinton, and he got left for dead. Simple as that. And that horrific episode, think about it. He was stabbed in the chest with a kitchen knife. And if somebody's doing that, they want you dead. <laughs> Because that ultimately is going to go near your heart, in your heart, cause some really big issues for your lungs and so on and so forth. And that means that the likelihood is that you didn't ever feel that that person was going to get a chance to come after you because you had literally executed them in that moment. That stabbing that took place, it was over a debt of 350 quid. Mind-blowing, isn't it? It's mind-blowing on every single level. First of all, life is precious and priceless, of course. But even if you are the individual who chooses to go and confront somebody and stab them, £350 for your freedom, for your liberty, for your life, is that what it's worth? Because for that individual perpetrator, imagine the ramifications that we're talking about when we're thinking about a debt so small. It's not a scenario where somebody's murdered somebody and this is a retaliation. It was just money. In this particular scenario, Brinson and a guy called Ashley Pring, he was 33, they'd both previously driven for Callum when he sold drugs, but they'd fallen out with him. And the reason for this fallout is they believed that Callum owed them money, so they decided that they were going to tax him. For those of you who don't know what tax is, it's a word that we use in the north, and clearly it's the word that they use in Plymouth, but it means we're going to rob you, we're going to steal from you, and that's what people say if they want to take something from somebody. It's very, very often used with street robberies. So when somebody taxes you, they're taking your cash. So how did they do this? Well, first of all, they lure him into an ambush, and there's this pretense that he's going to sell cocaine to 34-year-old Daniel James. So this Daniel James sets up a fake deal. You can tell, by the way, that Callum was not expecting any kind of retribution, retaliation set up because his own mother, Julie, drove him to the address in Southway Plymouth. So she took him there. It's 11 p.m. at night. So he's not expecting any trouble at all. And also, to be fair to Julian, to make it very, very clear, she had absolutely no idea it was a drug deal. She's still wearing her pyjamas under her clothes. When Callum arrives, he gets really badly attacked. So Brinton and multiple accomplices, they were armed with knives. They were wearing balaclavas. And this is this attempted robbery that then plays out. Can you imagine how Julie would be feeling in that moment. She's brought her son to this address and he's thinking he's just gonna go and deal, get this sorted out. And the consequences, now he's being attacked by all these different people. She's watching this scene unfold. This horrific scene play out in front of her and she hears her son screaming for her, screaming for his mom. The gang actually surrounded the car that she was in and then, she obviously is aware that Callum is in dire straits. And when he's actually stabbed, the blade goes through several organs. It penetrates several organs. He thought he was gonna die. And when the medical help actually did arrive, his mum was told he may not survive. To be fair, his life was saved by the paramedics and by incredible surgeons. It was so serious that attack, that he was in a coma for three weeks and he was in intensive care for four weeks. His right kidney ended up being removed and also part of his bowel. So aside from suffering afterwards with PTSD, which we can completely understand, he's also left with a stoma bag, which for a young man is going to be difficult. It's a big life change when you have a stoma bag. And that means that not just his experience psychologically is gonna cause him an issue, it's the fact that physically there are changes to his life that are unimaginable for this boy. 
When the actual case got to court, it is very unsurprising that Brinton was found guilty of GBH with intent and he was jailed for 15 years. 15 years is a big sentence. I imagine they could have gone for attempted murder, but potentially they felt that they could secure a conviction on this level as opposed to the more serious that may have engendered a bigger sentence. Pring, who was obviously there as well, they were sentenced to eight years and James was sentenced to five years. So they did have consequences for these actions, but can we all be real about this? They went to murder him. They went to execute him. There's absolutely no doubt whatsoever. They didn't think that Callum was coming away from that. And again, it always interests me, the psychology of individuals who do this because the consequences and ramifications for them are equally terrible and terrifying. Spending 15 years, even if you only spend eight in prison, at least on license, it changes and challenges the rest of your world. And to do that over something that realistically is so minor, it demonstrates the inappropriate weight that certain individuals place on things like money, reputation, and so on and so forth. Now that horrific ordeal for Callum, it changed him because like so many people, when all of a sudden you're in a situation where your actions have led to consequences you never even conceived, you didn't believe were possible, you reevaluate your life. And that's what happens. He starts to really turn his life around. And as I've said, that isn't to minimize the fact that he's made some mistakes. Lots of us do. We appreciate that people deal drugs. We appreciate that that can have negative consequences and connotations for the society around us. We see that, of course, I'm not taking that away. His family don't shy away from that, but he's very young, he's incredibly naive, and also he's been through something so highly traumatizing that suddenly he sees, I guess, in 2020 vision, the potential and possibilities of carrying on living his life this way. Now at this time, Callum was friends with 27-year-old Alexander Billy Humphreys, and he's better known as Billy. Now he lived in Callington, which is in East Cornwall, and although they weren't really close friends, Callum's family said that he did say he felt safe with him. So that's an important quality, of course. Even if you're not incredibly close, when you feel that somebody's got your back, or it's a developing friendship that may become closer, but as far as Callum was concerned, this is somebody that he was safe to be around. Now, Billy Humphreys, he'd actually been involved in a dispute with a 38-year-old guy. This is Andrew Haytree. And 38 is a big difference between Callum's age. Can we just note that as well? Grown man at 38. Now, Haytree is somebody you shouldn't mess with, with respect. He's had a really violent criminal past and one of the things that I will note is December 22nd, 2018, he was armed with a samurai sword. Yes, that's right, a samurai sword. I mean, they're not things you tend to have hanging around, are they? You know, when you're thinking about a weapon, a samurai sword feels more 15th century. But anyway, I digress. He literally had a samurai sword and he'd taken that with him but he'd actually, in an altercation, struck a man with a mallet at a house in Callington where he lived. So even though he was armed with a samurai sword, I'm imagining him in full gear, maybe ninja type. I don't think that actually happened, it's just in my head. But he used a mallet. Those of you who don't know what a mallet is, it's a big hammer. That's how I describe it. Think of a Thor type character. But you can imagine the damage that you can do to somebody with this. And also if you're going with something like a samurai sword, which can easily kill somebody or hitting somebody with a mallet, the damage that you are intentionally going to do can be dire or life-threatening. And after he's done this, he takes drugs from him. The drugs were worth around 2000 pounds. Now, the reason that he said he did this is he claimed he caught his daughter Kaylee buying cocaine from him. So he's suggesting in this moment that he isn't going there to steal the cocaine and drugs because he wants to sell it. He's going around to actually do it because he's creating some kind of good deed because he wants to prevent other kids going down the same road as his daughter potentially. Not sure that I'm completely convinced by that, but I'm gonna tell you 
the information that I'm aware of. Now, he does get convicted of assaults and it's occasioning actual bodily harm. Also gets charged and convicted of possession of a bladed article and possession of an offensive weapon and he gets two years for that. And he'd actually only been released on the 20th of February 2020, which is just shortly before the dispute with Billy Humphreys had begun. Now, again, maybe he was a father who was a knight in shining armour wanting to protect Kaylee, his daughter, because he was angry about the fact that she bought drugs from him. I am sure that many of us, if we believe that our child was procuring illegal substances from someone, we would feel really annoyed. I don't know, though. For the average human being, it would go something like this. Hi, is that Crime Stoppers? Hi. Yeah. There's an address that I know, because my daughter's been there, she's procured things that she shouldn't, so I'm going to anonymously give you the name and address of the individual living there so you can go and you can arrest them, because that's what you do. You're an organisation where I can anonymously leave tips and you will then go and deal with it appropriately and I'll look in the papers for when my good deed is done. That could happen, couldn't it? Or it could be a more direct approach. Just ring the police, tell them you know where a dealer is, say they're dealing to young people, and wait till they go around to make that arrest. But that's not why he tells the courts. You know, this is all some kind of justification. And I cannot, as I said, actually directly validate my beliefs, but they are based on obvious logic. Just throwing it out there, obvious logic. Don't really need to. But giving you a picture of somebody who doesn't take responsibility for those actions and isn't accountable and is blaming somebody else for the reasoning behind going ahead and doing what he'd done. You know, it's not good control. It shows a lack of capacity to deal with difficult feelings. Because like I said, even if he absolutely is innocent regarding the drug side of things, and it was just simply down to the fact he was really rageful about what happened to his daughter, to go and do that, it affects his daughter because he's not going to be around for her. It threatens another person's life, which is completely outside the realms of what was deserved for that scenario. And it puts the whole family at risk because dealing with drug dealers per se, particularly if they're bigger ones, the ramifications for your family might be problematic. So it's a mess. Now, the reason for this dispute that I'm talking about is unclear. So Haytree claimed that it was linked to his December 2018 assault. He said that the man that he claimed had supplied his daughter with drugs had basically been selling them on behalf of Billy Humphreys. So Haytree had been told that he was expected to repay the 2000 drug debt owed to Billy Humphreys and that if he didn't, he was going to get beaten up. Now, Haytree said that he made it clear he had literally no intention of repaying the money and then because of this, the tensions were increasing. So Haytree is refusing to actually repay this debt, if that's the case, and because of this, people are being annoyed by this refusal to do so. Arguably, let's just go on to Haytree's side for a moment and imagine that he's just served time inside. He would feel that he had already paid his debt to society and probably doesn't want to have to pay somebody who essentially he blames for him ending up without liberty. So that's all possible, but nonetheless, we're seeing this real cooking pot of possibility and potential. Now, Billy Humphrey's brother, this is Sean Humphreys, whom apparently Haytree had considered a good friend, he told Haytree that if he didn't repay the debt, he would have a problem with him too. Now, that would be difficult. Again, applying some neutrality here, if Sean Humphreys had been Haytree's friend and then is saying, listen, if you don't repay this money, there's going to be a problem between you and me. That's going to be hurtful. It's going to affect what we would consider our loyalties within friendships. And it possibly has the potential of exacerbating anger. Now, Haytree had allegedly told Sean, then we will have to sort it out. And he's asked to kind of expand on this. And when he's asked what it actually meant, he referred to a straightener. Now, what a straightener is, is a one-on-one -on -one fist fight. So 
he essentially is saying that he and Billy Humphreys would have a fight and then after the fight they basically shake hands. And this is the quote about the straightener. The first person to the floor or who gives up, you stop and shake hands. It's dealt with and done. So on one level, I would never agree with any kind of fighting. It is the bane of my life having two boys, particularly boys who are pretty handy and one who is an incredible Thai boxer because I'm always terrified that they're gonna get into some kind of altercation. And it's certainly more challenging for boys out there when we look at assaults on the streets and we look at murders and so on and so forth. It is young men and men in general who fare badly in these terms. Any parent listening to this, you know exactly what I'm saying, it's really hard. Having kids full stop, unless we could put them in glass boxes and carry them everywhere with us, I don't know just gently throwing rose petals at their hair for the rest of eternity. That isn't how it is. Life's messy, it's not fair. But arguably, boys particularly will talk about the fact that sometimes they wanna physically get into an altercation to resolve an issue. It's so far outside the realm of my understanding, I can't even pretend to relate. Like, I don't think getting hit off anybody would be fun. I don't think that getting into a scenario where I'm at risk of getting a broken nose is gonna be a good thing to do. But I also understand that culturally, different people experience different ways of dealing with scenarios. And if this were what we're talking about, and a situation where two people of an equal footing, so to speak, get into a situation where they have a one-on-one -on -one fight, as soon as somebody's like, nah, you know what, I'm getting hurt, stop. I do not profess or comprehend these things because I imagine that if I were in a scenario where somebody had been like, Emma, one-on-one, -on -one, first person to the floor, or gives up, shake hands, off we go before we even got to a scenario where that was gonna happen, probably five minutes before, I would find a way to not let that occur. So it would be, right, you ready? We're gonna just get in this situation, we throw a few punches when you feel, or I feel wanna give up, or just like, I don't know, you get knocked out. It's over, right, just shake hands. I'm not sure because if I was knocked out, I wouldn't be, I'd be on the floor and I wouldn't, I get what you're saying about the floor, but I wouldn't be able to shake hands, because you. You know, I, I'm worried. Well, I'd just, I'd just get your hand off the floor and I'd, I'd shake it. I just, I'm just, I don't think, do you know what? I, I give up. There you go, I give up. Should we shake hands now? I don't know, I don't think that's how it's gonna go. It's perfect, it's, it's in line. Just shake hands, I give up. I don't wanna get hurt. That's how it would go with me, but I appreciate that People are all different. And even though Hatry has said this, that this straightener is gonna occur, as far as I can tell from the research I've done, that was not the intention at all. What Hatry had in mind was very far from a one-on-one -on -one fist fight. So we have this situation now and the tensions are increasing, I'll be honest with you. There are more issues that are occurring. So early March 2020, Haiti apparently goes to speak to Sean and he's really angry, he's really drunk and that situation ends up in an altercation, they end up in a scuffle and at this point Haiti is hit in the leg with a hammer which clearly would have been very painful. Also, I don't know whether it's just me. I don't know whether it's just me. Is it just me? When I'm out, I don't know. It's rare. I don't go out a lot. But let's just say someone came to my house. Even in a home where we have a toolbox, because you know, things like DIY happen. It's occasional, I'm never involved, but it apparently does happen. I cannot imagine a moment where I'd just be able to like get a hammer out and hit somebody with it. Unless we're in a scenario where one of them is the carpenter and is on a job, how does this occur? So it seems like these individuals, or at least one of them in this circumstance, is armed. And that is worrying because it means that firstly, they're likely to always feel it threat of their life because there are so many tensions occurring that they need to feel armed. But secondly, that they can do more damage because if you act in this situation with a weapon, you can cause horrific injuries. I mean, a hammer 
when you think about the serial killers that we've covered, has been used to murder so many people because it's such an effective weapon. Now, how this altercation had essentially played out is that Haytree and Billy Humphreys had originally agreed to meet on the 10th of March 2020 at Kit Hill. This was to settle the score, shall we say. Haytree, he'd arrived with a friend for, shall we say the word, support. Apparently this person was coming to check it was a fair fight. I worry that that is probably not the reasoning. I hope it was. I hope Haytree had got the friend and been like, I want you to make sure it's a very fair fight. Anyone on the floor or anyone giving up, we just shake our hands, we resolve it. I guess it could have been that. But turns out that Billy Humphreys doesn't show up. So they then followed verbal altercations between the two of them. So they'd exchanged these various messages. They'd called one another in heated rows and this feud escalates. I guess what we're seeing is that Haytree has clear intent to resolve this situation. By hook or by crook, it's gonna happen. Billy didn't turn up for that fight. He probably is quite aware that Haytree is somebody that has potential violence-wise, and he's probably a little bit scared. That would make perfect sense. Whereas Haytree is somebody who wants to get this sorted. Now, another thing that allegedly happens is that Haytree threatens both Billy Humphreys and his family. Specifically, apparently he threatened his grandmother. He said he'd go around and attack whoever answered the door. So he said, if Billy Humphreys doesn't fight, I'm gonna come around and I'm gonna sort out whoever happens to be unlucky enough to open the door. So Billy Humphreys stated that Haytree, as far as he was concerned, was, in his words, on the war path that night. And he claimed he was hoping to smooth it over at Kit Hill, but he had, again, in his words, no idea how much of a lunatic Haytree was. So Thursday, 26th of March, 2020. So this particular evening, Haytree's actually at a small party at his girlfriend's house and he and his girlfriend drank a bottle of vodka between them, which is a lot of alcohol. I'm sure that for those of you who are drinkers of spirits, you know that half a bottle of vodka is gonna knock a lot of us out. I would be, I don't know, being resuscitated in hospital, I kid you not. Some people, I guess, have a bigger resilience and threshold where alcohol is concerned, but for the most part, at least if it's a decent sized bottle, that's going to be problematic for your inhibitions and also problematic for the way you see the world. We see that people, particularly individuals with a propensity for violence when they're drunk, they often are easily provoked. Also, he'd actually drank a couple of gins and taken a couple of Valium. So that's a huge amount of problems within his physiology all occurring at once. Now, according to Haytree, he was told that Billy Humphreys is planning on calling at the address. Now, that upsets him. He's concerned for his girlfriend's safety, he's concerned for his girlfriend's kids. So Haytree then calls Billy Humphreys and tells him to meet him at Kit Hill now. So he wants to take it apparently from his girlfriend's home to a place which is void of danger to them. Now at this point, Haytree contacts a friend. He says that he wants to take him there for support, but this mate has basically refused. Instead, he sends him a text message and he states, calm down buddy and chill, which props to that mate, that's a good mate. The only thing that would have been better than that was, I don't know, driving round to Haytree's house and using duct tape to tie him to a chair until he sobered up. But when it comes down to it, the fact that this friend of his bothered to get back and say, look, you know, you don't need to do this, chill out. That was the right advice. And my God, why didn't Haytree listen? And it's important to note that because when people create what I would consider barriers to these behaviors, such as letting you know what they think, it's not a good idea, calm down, chill. It can be enough in many cases to divert the behavior that would have played out, but it doesn't. So Haytree isn't calmed by this. He doesn't listen to the advice. He's just absolutely set on what he wants to achieve, which is to sort out the beef that he's got. So at this point, Haytree gathers weapons in preparation for this confrontation, which 
I don't know. I'm throwing it out there on a logic level, blows apart the idea that we're just going to meet. Just going to have a one-on-one. -on -one. It's all going to be fine, isn't it? Just shake our hands, go home, have a drink and a nice dinner with our friends and family. Now, bear in mind, after he's gathered these weapons, he is under the influence. He's drank a lot of alcohol. He's also taken Valium. So he's not thinking straight. I mean, he has the wherewithal to imagine that he's going to need these particular items. He says because he wanted a deterrent. Now, if we're going to take that at face value, it means that he believed that if people came and saw that he was armed, they would be less likely ready to harm him because of danger that he would pose. And this is apparently the logic at that moment in time as far as he's concerned. He then drives under the influence, putting a lot of other people's lives at risk as far as I'm concerned. You are very drunk and you're also on Valium and yet you get in a vehicle and he takes his girlfriend's Vauxhall Zafira and goes towards Kit Hill. That highly intoxicated state would have meant that he could have knocked down anyone, he could have driven into anybody else's car. And you have to think about that because again, what does that say about impulse control? For me, that's an inexcusable situation. I genuinely struggle with people who drink drive. I have no sympathy for them and no compassion for them. They do not need to do it. So the very fact that he's willing to do that means that he's willing to put other people's lives at risk. End of. It's a crime enough as far as I'm concerned, what I'm talking about now. Now, on the way, he actually encounters 30-year-old Christian Humphreys, and he's actually with his girlfriend, Tara, and he's a friend of Hatred's. Hatred was actually in a relationship with his sister, Christy. Now, he'd been at a party with him earlier, and he'd also been drinking. So, Hatred pulls up in the car and tells him it's all kicking off at Kit Hill. So Christian Humphreys joins Haytree and the pair drive to Kit Hill. It's one of those moments, isn't it? Where you're thinking to yourself, is it the sliding door experience that I'm describing? Christian Humphreys, wrong place, wrong time essentially, wrong opportunity that may never have played out if he'd just walked down a different street with his girlfriend. Christian Humphreys, he later claims that Hatry at no point explained where they were going or why. So he assumes that it's just to go and get loads more alcohol. But after hearing Hatry's call to Billy, Humphreys becomes concerned. Just a lot of swearing, F you, F this. And he actually tries to interrupt the call to find out what's going on. And he's getting more alarmed because Hatry is driving towards Kit Hill. So then he claims he's trying to talk him out of it. You know, Hatry's still on probation. This is a problem. He'll be on license. That means he can be called back to prison. And that in itself is an incentive to try to stop him carrying out any actions that could contravene the license that he's under. According to Callum's family, Callum had actually gone out at 3 p.m. that day and he had spent the day with Billy Humphreys in Cornwall. That's a relatively long way away from his home in Plymouth. So, presume that Callum must have been there with Billy Humphreys when he receives the call from Haytree. Callum, by the way, has never even met Haytree. So, this is not a scenario where Callum is aware of the relationship that Billy and Haytree have, nor at this moment in time would he have that much of an investment in what's playing out. So, he's with Billy. So, he sets off with him to Kit Hill also with his younger brother, Daniel Humphreys. So Billy had a younger brother who went with them. Now, what Callum knew exactly, we don't know. It's been fiercely contested, it really has. Just to say that now, there are differing ideas and identities with how this played out. Meanwhile, as all this is playing out, Christian Humphreys' partner, she's actually overheard a conversation about the arranged fight. Now, she's really concerned about this. So she asks a neighbour to take her to Kit Hill, probably with the mindset in that moment to stop 
the fight happening, to intervene, even though it's not a good idea for people to get involved in these circumstances. Often, if you are in a relationship with somebody and you have that connection with them and you care deeply for them, often you will believe that your presence can reduce any conflict, remove that person from the situation and at least protect them. Now, as arranged, the men meet. They meet in this isolated car park on Kit Hill near Callington. It's a beauty spot, to be fair, in East Cornwall. It's gorgeous. Haytree and Christian Humphreys, they arrive in one car. And then Billy Humphreys and his brother Daniel and Callum, they arrive in another. Now, it's not exactly clear what happens next. What we do know is that Callum ends up out of the car alone. Bear in mind, Callum has not got any issue with hatred, nor has he been in a scenario that has led to this moment in time. And suddenly, he's by himself out of the car. At this point, he's brutally assaulted by hatred and Christian Humphreys. Hatred's got the child's cricket bat and knife, and Christian Humphreys has got this piece of wood. And the attack that is launched on Callum is just beyond frenzied. It's hard to find a word that will really conceptualise what I'm trying to convey to you right now. Brutality personified. Frenzied is probably the best way of referring to it because it demonstrates the inescapable reality of somebody just carrying on without any thought or understanding of the things that they are doing and the impact they are having because it's animalistic it's just this absolute destruction of another human being. So they're repeatedly hitting him with the cricket bat, with the the piece of wood and the kick in him. Billy Humphreys is watching this from his car, watching it. He'd later state the attack on Callum continued even when Callum was lay on the floor, just unconscious. Bear in mind what they say about someone who's on the floor or says they've had enough, shake hands and move on. Forget the fact that Callum's not even involved in the beef between them. Even when he is lay on the ground unconscious, they are frantically hitting him over and over again. Quote, that's taken from the court. They repeatedly struck him about the head. And they were hitting him so hard with that child's cricket bat, they ultimately broke on him. Now, whilst this is happening, Billy and Daniel Humphreys, they just remain in the vehicle. They didn't intervene. They didn't assist Callum in any way. It's hard for me to tell you that because there's an automatic assumption that if your friend is in dire need, if there are two men attacking them so brutally that we're in a position where they're unconscious, you just observe. Billy Humphreys later claimed that he had told Callum to stay in the car but that he got out. And Daniel Humphreys would claim he hadn't wanted to go to Kit Hill and fight at all. They had only gone as hatred had threatened to go to his grandmother's house. So everyone's in a scenario where there is denial, there is a lack of accountability, there is certainly no protection of an individual who has been brutalised. And Callum is now the only victim in this circumstance. Now the attack on Callum, it only ended when Billy Humphreys finally drove his car, which was a Reynolds McGann at Haytree and Christian Humphreys. So Haytree gets struck by the vehicle and he gets run over and he is seriously injured. Now Christian Humphreys somehow, and it is a shock that he manages to just escape any serious injury. He is hit by the car but he goes onto the bonnet, he hits the windscreen, then he goes over the top of the vehicle, like you see in stunt movies, essentially. Then, 
Daniel Humphreys apparently gets out of the car and he does try to drag Callum into the vehicle, but apparently he's a dead weight. I don't know. Yes, because he's just been beaten up in front of you with a range of weapons to a point where he is literally unconscious. Of course, he's a dead weight. Now, Billy Humphreys at this point fears his brother may get assaulted. He can hear this other car approaching and thought it could be more of Hatry's associate. So he tells his brother to come back to the car and shouts, come on, let's go. Yeah. Come on. Let's go. Aside from when they do that, driving away at speed, they leave Callum unconscious, face down, and literally dying by himself at the scene. They later dump that car in a country lane three miles away. And then they hid out at a building site for the next couple of days and slept in a field, which to me screams guilt. Culpability. Why would you dump the car? And why aren't you thinking about Callum, who you've left for dead in the mud? How can anybody do that? How little is Callum's life worth in that moment? Now, shortly after Billy and Daniel Humphreys left the scene, Christian Humphreys' partner, Tara, she arrives with her neighbour. That was the car Billy Humphreys had actually heard, by the way. It hadn't been Hatry's reinforcements. At this point, they find Hatry and they establish that he's been severely injured. He's bleeding from his head. Now they have clearly very injured Hatry. Christian Humphreys doesn't literally want them to call the emergency services and he's protesting this, but they do. They go ahead and do it. He didn't want the police involved at all. As far as he's concerned, the sooner they can get away from that scene, which has got very incriminating evidence because Callum is there, he just wants to be gone. So there's no link. But he also knows that Hatry is absolutely in dire need of medical attention. Now, Christian Humphreys, as I've said, he didn't really have any injuries whatsoever. So he ends up dragging Hatry into the car, which is worrying because Hatry could have had some serious internal bleeding injuries. He could have had some issues with his back or neck being broken. And by dragging him, he could have exacerbated those problems and even caused something like paralysis. He's thinking only about his own needs at this moment in time. So he manages to get him into the car and they flee the scene before the ambulance even arrives. He then takes Hatry to an address in Gunners Lake, that's where he lives. As Hatry is kind of coming round, he initially refuses. The ambulance claims it's absolutely fine. In hindsight, that was definitely to do, I don't know, with not wanting the police to get involved either. Now, ultimately, an ambulance is actually called to the address and the paramedic who sees Hatry says to him he needs to go to hospital. I imagine that that would be quite obvious. You need to go to hospital. You look like you've been run over by a car. It's funny you should say that. No, it's not funny. You seriously look like you need to go to hospital. Absolutely fine. Everybody's overreacting. I think you have a tire mark on your chest. It's just the new fashion. You need to go to hospital. I don't know. You might have ruptured your spleen and your shoulder looks like a super weird shape. He must have been in a lot of pain without a doubt because it's established when he does go to hospital that he'd suffered a dislocated left shoulder which would be agony he had a fracture to his right heel bone and his ankle bone he had a hole at the back of his head he had two fractured vertebrae two fractured ribs fractured breastbone and damage to his heart so his injuries were really really serious now bear in mind that Tara has also earlier called the paramedics to arrive at Kit Hill. So they've gone there, and of course, who's there? Callum. He's alone, he's unconscious, he's critically injured, and also he'd been stripped naked. So before his attackers had actually left, they'd removed his clothes. This is in an attempt to dispose of the evidence, to dispose of forensics. So they find him, as I say, critically injured. Imagine that lonely scene, this young man is left for dead, abandoned even by his friends. He gets rushed to Derryford Hospital and 
even though he's been taken there, I want you to consider the reality that this was a, a remote beauty spot and the consequences of that is if they had not been called to attend him, he would just have been left there. How long would it have been before Callum was discovered? It's really sad to tell you at this point that Callum doesn't get better. He doesn't recover from any of his injuries. He dies two days later. And when they did the autopsy, wow. It established that he'd had at least 42 separate injuries. Many of those were to his head. They said that the injuries had been caused by a sustained and repeated series of blows to his head and to his body with weapons. The death itself, they say, was caused by the head injuries from at least four separate heavy blows. His skull had been fractured and it would also be found that Callum had even suffered defensive injuries to his hands. He was trying to protect himself. Now, Haytree, he spends several days in hospital and he and Kristen Humphreys, they're ultimately arrested and charged with Callum's murder. Haytree is then recalled to prison because he'd been on probation for the earlier offence. And at this point, they both deny any responsibility for Callum's death claim Billy Humphreys had hit Callum with the car and caused the fatal injuries, which is, I don't know, a bit convenient, isn't it? Really? And also, if you're gonna get hit by a car, you're not gonna have loads of separate injuries on your head, are you? Because you're gonna get hit once or twice if you get run over again by a wheel. But nonetheless, that's what they're saying. So Haytree initially claims that he'd been knocked out almost as soon as he got out of the car. A little bit on the convenience side. I just got out of the car and then I just got knocked down. What by? I don't know. It may have been a large animal. It may have been an alien. It may have been... I can't think of anything else that would make sense. I'm feeling that the alien is probably an overreach when it comes down to possibly... I'm going to stay with a large animal or an alien. Either of those. Insert wherever you feel is required. But I'm innocent. So this is his story. So now we also have Billy Humphrey's name in the mix, which means that the police are looking for him and he actually gives himself up to the police. Now, bear in mind, at this point, Haytree and Christian Humphreys have said they are totally innocent. But the thing about innocence that really kind of works for the innocent is the police don't find things that, I don't know, could be considered incriminating. You know, you don't want strong forensic evidence, for example, connecting you. So if the police find these things, it may undermine that position that actually you've done nothing wrong. Are you totally innocent? I am so innocent, absolutely innocent. If I had a nickname, it would be innocent. You weren't involved at all in this brutal beating. Had nothing to do with it. Didn't have any weapons with you. Absolutely no way would I ever have weapons. And actually, to be fair, even if I did have weapons, they would only be used as a deterrent, you haven't actually used them. Can you explain, therefore, why your weapons are in the car and they have forensic evidence saying that you use them, not as a deterrent, and also that there are weapons at the scene that connect you with them? I'm innocent. I don't know. I don't know what to say. I'm an innocent person with a visual deterrent in my car. Going nowhere, are we? Going nowhere at this point. So claiming innocence, but very clearly connected. So they find this number of weapons at the scene and in the cars. And those weapons include a hammer, a broken knife, broken child's cricket bat, a dagger, and a large piece of wood. Just allow your brain to gestate on that for a moment. A hammer, a broken knife, a broken child's cricket bat, a dagger, and a large piece of wood. Now, the cricket bat itself and the wood had traces of Callum's blood on them. Meanwhile, Haytree's own trainers, bear in mind that he said that, you know, he just got out of the car and then was unconscious, as if Spock from Star Trek had ran in and zonked him out, even though apparently that's happened. His own trainers 
have blood hair and flesh on them belonging to Callum. That's right, blood, hair and flesh on them. The remnants of that forensic material from Callum were literally embedded into the stitching. Think about the violence that you're using, stamping and kicking constantly, repeatedly to get that kind of forensic detail transferred from somebody's body on to your physical wear. So now we have the trial. Of course, they are pleading not guilty. So this means that the whole family has to go through everything because clearly they have to witness what is happening and see all the evidence that will be brought forward if that is not traumatizing enough to have lost their brother, their son. It's the fact that you have to relive it, this re-traumatization that occurs during these scenarios. So it begins in August in 2021. It's at Plymouth Crown Court. Haytree and Christian Humphreys, they've already pleaded not guilty to murder and not guilty to conspiracy to commit violent disorder. Billy Humphreys had pleaded not guilty to conspiracy to commit violent disorder and GBH with intent. This is in relation to the injuries inflicted on Haytree with the car, because clearly Haytree was very badly injured. And his brother, Daniel Humphreys, also pleaded not guilty to conspiracy to commit violent disorder and GBH with intent. So this is where we are when the trial begins. Now in court, Haytree claims that he was just gonna have a straightener fight you know, that infamous straightener fight where they just have a bit of a scuffle, shake hands, move on. And he said it was all over this drug debt that he had. So when he's asked, okay, why did you get out of that car that night? He said, I got out of the car because I didn't want to lose face. So he's letting you know that reputation's important to him. But he said that he'd only intended for the situation to be a one-on-one -on -one fight. Now bear in mind, Callum isn't even the person that he should be having a fight with, and that's not how it played out at all. So when you think about the circumstances of Callum's death and what occurred, that mindset we're hearing as far as Haytree's reporting is distinct to the reality of what occurred. First of all, Haytree brings weapons. Also, brings another person who's willing to use those weapons. Now Haytree claims that Callum got out of the car with a hammer. Now he's expecting Billy Humphreys at that moment in time, so he asks him, who the F are you? He then claims that the only reason that he retaliated is because Callum struck him on the back of the head with a hammer as he was walking away. Furthermore, he then claims that he only ever hit Callum twice. He said he hit him once with a cricket bat, the child's one that we've talked about, and he said that that caused Callum to drop the hammer and one kick to the head as Callum was basically apparently bending down to pick it up. So he claims he's trying to knock the hammer out of Callum's hand and essentially as he does that, he kicks him in the head by mistake. He then says he's struck by the car, doesn't have any other re recollection of the events after he's run over. He then maintains as well that Billy Humphreys also ran Callum over. Now, Christian Humphreys, meanwhile, he claims that he decided to leave when he saw Haytree get the cricket bat out of the boot. He said he was walking away when suddenly he hears another car pull up and he hears three doors slam. So he's implying that Billy Humphreys and his brother and Callum all got out of the car. It's, by the way, later pointed out to him that a Renault McGann that Billy Humphreys was driving only had two doors. So doesn't really make sense, does it? I don't know, unless somebody was in the boot and that wasn't true. But this is the story that's being told. I do concede, however, and let me tell you, I do concede that in scenarios of stress, people do remember things inaccurately. So I cannot say that he didn't believe that there were three doors slamming. I'm just saying that it's pointed out in court that that doesn't make sense. So when he hears the slamming of these doors, apparently he decides it is going to rejoin Haytree. He felt that it wouldn't be a fair fight otherwise. So he claims that he sees Haytree and Callum, they're about two or three feet apart. And according to Christian Humphreys, Callum's on his knees at this point. Then apparently he hears a car revving up and he sees Billy Humphreys accelerating at them. He claims that that car then strikes Callum on the back and the back of the head and then runs him over. And Christian Humphreys claims he's also at this point 
hit by the car and knocked to the ground. He said he then got up and the car then struck him again and this time it throws him to the ground. Then he's hit a third time. This guy's unlucky when it comes down to vehicles, isn't he? I mean, like, getting hit once would be difficult, but three times? That's really, really unlucky. But this is what he's saying. So he gets hit this third time, rolls over the bonnet, hits the windscreen, and apparently goes over the roof like a rag doll. That's his description, not mine. And he claims, didn't assault Callum at all. I didn't. I was not no absolutely nothing to do with me i do not even know what you are talking about yeah so he said he didn't assault callum and he'd only used the piece of wood for support as his foot had been hurt oh it's very convenient that there was a piece of wood i don't know an adequate size to help with your limp but this is the story being told and even though i don't know you would need to be a seven-year-old child with a basic understanding of just having a normal thought process. It wouldn't make sense to you. With respect, we don't need to think like that. We didn't need to figure out whether he's telling the truth or otherwise, because the pathology evidence shows it's a lie. Callum's blood had been found on the piece of wood. It had been found to be used as a weapon. That was without any doubt. Now, Billy Humphreys, he, meanwhile, claims that the dispute isn't even over a drug debt. In fact, he denies fully being a dealer at all. He said the reason that that whole fight situation escalated was because he disrespected Hatry. Basically, he got gobby on the phone with him and Hatry just would not let it go. He just would not let it go. This is, of course, only according to Billy Humphreys. I'm not saying this is factual, but this is what he's saying. So they've had this altercation and... He claims he literally wanted to make peace with Hatry at Kit Hill. It's bizarre, isn't it? There's all of this Kit Hill thing. It's all going to be fine. We'll just let it go. It's just a straightener. Everything's okay as long as we shake on it. But hang on a minute. We've got Callum dead. We've got his flesh embedded in two trainers. Can we please be rational about the fact that this is not just about shaking hands and saying goodbye? This is something far deeper and far darker. But the prosecutor, well, he says to Billy that that doesn't make sense. He alleges that he'd actually recruited both Callum and his younger brother because if he genuinely wanted to avoid any conflict, he could just have called the police. If he was concerned about his grand safety, he could have gone there with his brothers. Instead, he travelled to a location to an arranged fight. We also have to be conscious that a prosecutor is a very wealthy barrister. And the idea that a very wealthy barrister can ever understand what it's like to be a working class lad or to have a different cultural understanding about how you sort things out, it's just impossible for them to stretch. They might work with people and act like they understand the types of human beings that they deal with, but it's not true. So I know, and I'm sure lots of you know, people who will always leave the police out of it. It really wouldn't matter if the person that has aggrieved them and you know that they're responsible for that and you have evidence that you could give the police for that to play out in legal setting, often particular individuals will reject that opportunity. They feel that it's a snitching scenario. They like to resolve it themselves. So the prosecutor saying that they don't understand why they didn't involve the police is very, very common. I'm not saying it's correct. Ring the police. That's why we pay our taxes. But nonetheless, it isn't outside the sphere of understanding that people like to sort these things out themselves, even though it's not ideal and certainly can lead to some terrible consequences. So this is what the prosecutor is saying. You could have done that, but you didn't. You arranged this fight. Now, Billy Humphreys also claims that he had driven at Haytree and Christian Humphreys to literally stop them killing his loyal friend. So he's not denying that he did that, but he's saying basically I used the car as a weapon so that I could stop the attack. But we also have to remember that Billy Humphreys watched the attack. He watched Callum being senselessly, ferociously beaten in a frenzied attack and he let that occur 
Yeah, he had driven at the men in retaliation, as far as I'm concerned. It, it wasn't in defense of Callum. It was about harming the individuals that in that moment he felt incensed by. It wasn't about protecting Callum. Otherwise, I wouldn't be telling this story. Billy Humphreys stated this between he and the prosecutor. I feel terrible for his death. I feel partly responsible for picking him up that day. Yes, because you are partly responsible. Also, 100% responsible for watching whilst your little friend was beaten to death. Now, he did admit in court that he'd acted in a cowardly manner. And to some degree, no one knows how they will react and respond in circumstances where they are witnessing something highly traumatic. I am sure that Billy Humphreys would wish that Callum hadn't been murdered in such a horrific way in front of him. I don't doubt that. But the consequences of letting him deal with that situation alone means that I'm telling you this tale today. Bear in mind, Callum's family had already suffered a horrific loss in unimaginable circumstances. Those of you who've lost people traumatically, I know some of you have lost members of the family to murder, you know that feeling. You wouldn't wish anybody to have to face it. But what I would say compounds the horror that they're dealing with is the portrayal of Callum in both the press and in the court proceedings. Now this is in a large part down to what Hatry and Christian Humphreys told the police in the court. So their job in trying to create an innocence is to shift blame onto Callum. So Hatry claims that Callum had emerged from Billy Humphreys' car brandishing his hammer and attacked him first. They also allege that the fatal injuries inflicted on Callum were caused by Billy Humphreys, striking him with the car when he drove at them. The judge appeared to accept that Callum had been armed with a hammer, concluded that he'd been given it by Billy Humphreys. However, it was not accepted that he had struck the first blow. Nor was it accepted that his injuries had been caused by the car because there was loads of strong forensic and pathology evidence establishing the cause of Callum's death and also the role of each defendant in the fight. So it proved beyond doubt that the fatal injuries had already been inflicted by Hatry and Christian Humphreys before Billy Humphreys drove at them. In fact, it was found Billy Humphreys acted not in defense of Callum. It was too late. But as I said, in retaliation for the attack upon him. Now, Callum's family, and I can tell you because I've spoken to them, they have literally been left heartbroken. They cannot comprehend or reconcile the image that's been portrayed of him. This individual who has had so much blame projected onto him, in spite of the fact that he's the victim in this case. They knew Callum. He was a kind, caring young man. They felt he had everything to live for. He was really happy with his life. He was the father of a five-year-old son. But he was also, as I said earlier on, incredibly vulnerable because of his special needs. His family remained absolutely adamant that he didn't know anything about the arranged fight. He was just out with his friends that day. That he was driven to the scene by his supposed friend, Billy Humphreys, completely unaware of what was planned. And in fact, for his family, the suggestion that Callum was armed with a hammer and not only was armed, but somehow instigated the attack upon him is one of the most hurtful things for that whole family to bear. They say that one of the things about Callum was that he was never aggressive, not even in the slightest. He wasn't a fighter. He was childlike in this regard. He had this real harmless capacity around him. He just wasn't somebody who looked for trouble. His family said what is very difficult for them to manage emotionally is they know he would have experienced pure terror. He would have been horrified by the whole dangerous situation he'd found himself in. 
he would have been completely unprepared and would not have had a clue what to do in that moment. Bear in mind, let me take you back to when we talked about this earlier, when he had his initial scenario unfold where he was very seriously injured when he was stabbed. He wasn't there fighting. He was a victim again in that situation. This is not an individual who goes around armed and aggressive. This is somebody who's very naive and that fragility and vulnerability plays out in the circumstances that we're discussing right now. Now, as I said right at the very beginning of this, I've been working with Callum's family. They've been absolutely left heartbroken. First of all, by the loss, clearly, of the family member they adored, but also by the image that's being portrayed of him. They knew him as a kind, caring young man. They believed that Callum had literally everything to live for. He was really happy, really content with his life. He's the father of a five-year-old son. And as I said really early on in this, he was a very vulnerable individual because of his special needs. Now, his family remained absolutely adamant that Callum knew nothing of the arranged fight. They say that he would have felt he was just out with his friends that day. Remember, he was driven to the scene by his supposed friend, Billy Humphreys. I'm putting supposed in there for a very clear reason. They feel that he was completely unaware of what was planned. And what really galls them is the suggestion that Callum was armed with a hammer and somehow instigated the attack upon him is one of the most hurtful things the family have ever had to endure. First of all, they state that Callum wasn't aggressive in the slightest. And whilst he's obviously been in situations before where there has been violence, he's not been the person being violent. Let me draw your attention back to the very beginning when he's almost murdered, stabbed in such a way that he ends up with a stoma back and he's in a coma for a long period of time. This is not an individual who has enjoyed fighting. He already has PTSD because of this. The likelihood that he's gonna then be like 10 men getting out of a car and taking on two other individuals, one with a violent history, that's relatively unlikely, per se, before you even bring in the developmental issues that Callum suffered. He wasn't a fighter. In fact, people say that he was far more childlike in this regard. In fact, he was completely harmless. His family say that he would have been blindsided when he realized that there was a problem happening. He said they would have been absolutely terrified by the dangerous situation he'd found himself in. Their belief is that when Billy Humphreys arrived in the car park at Kit Hill, Hatry and Christian Humphreys were already there. And as we know, they had weapons and they believed that they started to strike the car and the windscreen with the weapons. And Callum would have been terrified by this. And the reaction to that is that he would have just got out of the car to flee. Bear in mind, he has been the recipient of a near-death experience in a prior experience. So understandably, and if you suffer from PTSD, you will know, it makes you freeze, it makes you fight or flee. He's not a fighter. But you can imagine in that moment just thinking, how the hell do I get out of here? I have nothing to do with this. Now, we know Billy and Daniel Humphreys remain inside. So Callum is therefore alone and vulnerable. And they believe it's at this point that he's subjected to that brutal, frenzied assault. They believe that Haytree and Humphreys just took all their anger out on him. And I'll be honest with you, I've studied this, I've researched this, and I appreciate that I have worked with the family to tell this story. And it is partly their story that I am telling, their version of events. But let me tell you, those version of events make sense based on the evidence. First of all, Callum was not the aggressive type. So it seems really unlikely he'd have chosen to confront two armed men. Also, if that had been the plan, you'd have expected Billy Humphreys and his brother to have joined in. Furthermore, the injury to the back of Hatry's head, it wasn't even caused by a hammer blow, as he alleged. It happened when the car struck and ran over him. Billy Humphreys even supported that contention. And he stated that Callum was unarmed when he exited the vehicle. Why would Callum get out to fight two armed men by himself without a weapon? Does not make sense. Now, if Callum was utterly unaware of the arranged fight, 
You can only imagine the shock, the horror, the fear that he would have experienced as they pull into the car park. Two armed men suddenly violently attacking the vehicle and then in panic, Callum instinctively gets out to escape. But as far as Haytree and Christian Humphreys are concerned, Callum's there to fight. So they go for him. They viciously attack him. Meanwhile, we've got Billy and Daniel Humphreys just sitting and watching. It's a horrific image to conjure in one's mind. Now, ultimately, when it came down to the jury, they did not believe Haytree and Christian Humphreys version of events, i.e. that Callum's fatal injuries had been caused when he was struck by Billy Humphreys' car. They were able to see straight through their web of lies. I mean, it was inconsistent with the injuries. It didn't make any sense whatsoever. And the reality is that both parties left Callum for dead. So if anybody was innocent in this situation, why the hell would they let that individual just be left dying in the mud? Because if you're innocent, you're going to help. We get to the 21st of September 2021. There was a four week trial, nearly eight hours of deliberation. And at this point, the jury find Haytree and Christian Humphreys guilty of murder and conspiracy to commit a violent disorder. Christian Humphreys was sentenced to life with a minimum term of 15 years. Haytree, he was sentenced to life with a minimum term of 26 years. It was a longer sentence because it was proved that he had basically been the prime mover and he also brought multiple weapons to the scene. The judge who sentenced both of them said this, it matters not who struck the fatal blow. You both actively anticipated in this vicious attack. This was a senseless murder of a young man with his whole life ahead of him. Also worth noting that neither Hatrian nor Christian Humphreys have ever expressed any remorse for Callum's death. Something that I think is difficult to imagine from a family's perspective because you know that you have lost something priceless and precious within your family and your hope is that those who've taken that life may reflect and recognise that that loss is something worthy of remorse but not in these cases. And at the end of the trial, Haytree actually looked at Callum's mum and laughed. I don't know about any of you listening to this, but I feel that there should be some kind of, I don't know, extra law rule. You know, you get your sentence and then you're closely monitored by the judge and the prosecution and actually the jury as well. And as long as you look like you've accepted guilt and that you are a little bit sad that you may be going away for a long time, you know, you get to be taken down. However, if you smirk or you laugh or you swear at the aggrieved family, the judge can just be like, hey, jury, maverick here, but how many extra years? We've come to the conclusion of 700 years. Brilliant. That kind of thing in my head would be appropriate. The idea that you would be so disrespectful to a mother who is grieving, the idea that you cannot for one moment step aside from what you have caused and think about the impact of it on an emotional level as opposed to an egocentric level about what you are facing speaks volumes. Now, Billy Humphreys, remember he's Callum's friend who should have defended him in my opinion, but never mind. He gets convicted of conspiracy to commit violent disorder and GBH with intent and he gets sentenced to 11 years. He'll serve two thirds of that sentence. Billy Humphrey's brother, Daniel, he was in the car at the time, remember? Well, he's found not guilty of conspiracy to commit violent disorder. And you can understand that without a doubt because he didn't actually take any actions that caused the consequences we're talking about today. And I imagine that whilst I'm not for one minute defending that Daniel did nothing in that moment, Again, he's more a victim of circumstance than Billy, who did knock somebody down, and certainly Haytree et al, who killed Callum, and did so in the most gruesome of ways. Callum's family actually released a statement following the sentencing. They said, We as a family are devastated by the loss of our darling Callum. He was a loving and caring son. 
partner, father and brother. And we will never, ever get over losing him. A mother should never have to bury her child and Callan's loss will be felt by the whole family for the rest of our lives. Callan was vulnerable, disabled and had no idea what was planned at Kit Hill on that fateful night. Those responsible are really the most violent, cruel and horrible people. Haytree and Christian Humphrey's actions were absolutely abhorrent. Without a doubt, I can say that. But Billy Humphrey's actions were also unforgivable. Now he stated in court that he felt terrible about his friend's death, but his actions at the time did not state that, did they? Why? He got Callum involved in a really dangerous situation that had nothing to do with him. He watched as he was basically beaten to death in front of him. And finally, he just left his friend critically injured to die alone. As I said, the only reason Callum was found that night is because Christian Humphrey's partner called emergency services for hatred. The judge actually expressed an opinion in court that had she not done so, Callum most probably would never have been found until the next morning. Callum's family, they've said they'll always regret letting Callum go out that day. His mum, Julie, hadn't actually wanted him to go. They wished that they'd talked him into staying. His sister, Sabrina, and her family, they literally feel like they've been destroyed by the manner of Callum's death. She actually moved into his room after he died. She wanted to feel closer to him. The family say that the house feels really empty. Now he's gone. He's always so loud and lively. And Julie, of course, she says she's never, ever going to get over losing her son. And of course, Louis, his little boy, Callum's son, the child that's not going to grow up with a father, the child who at some point in the future is going to have to reconcile how his dad was stolen from him, how his dad was murdered and left naked and dying, abandoned even by his friends. For that child, it isn't just a father that's been stolen, a mentor, a role model, a male who loves him. It's a future. It's the family holidays that he'll never experience with his father. It's the jumping in cold, freezing water because his dad loved to do so. It's having his head stroked, just as Julie used to stroke Callum's. All these things have been robbed from this child. And for what? Because somebody's reputation was dinted? It's incomprehensible to me that the family don't just have to live with the loss. They have to live with the reality that people who don't know this case intimately may conclude that somehow Callum was a part of what ended his life. Something they believe is so wholly distinct from the reality. And as I said, certainly when you look at the evidence, I support their perspective. They sent me a note about Callum's son. And let's not forget, he had a partner. And let's not forget as well that even those who were affected by the killers, people within their families are all victims to some degree. But for Callum's family, it's a permanent loss. They don't get to see their loved one again. In fact, after I'd sent the research to Sabrina and the family to make sure that they felt okay about talking about this and that my facts were correct, Obviously, we want to protect Louis, which is why we've not put any specific photographs to identify him in this particular video. But they wanted him to be a part of it as far as the recognition, recollection and meaning that Callum has in this little boy's life. A life that he will no longer get to see unfold. A life fully loved, surrounded by so much support, don't get me wrong, but one with a huge 
callum shaped hole in it. They sent me this paragraph saying that Louis collects feathers. He collects feathers because he believes that his daddy is sending them to him. And once he actually said, can I make a wish? And they said, yeah, make a wish. He said, my wish is for my daddy to come back. And that's just heartbreaking, isn't it? Because it means that this little boy feels that void. And don't get me wrong, there is a part of me that also feels the poignancy and beauty of a child who was so loved by a parent that even in loss, they mean something to their memories. They connect with that. But Louis should have his dad without a doubt. Also, Sabrina says that she looks at Louis and every time she looks at him, she sees his daddy staring back at her. She said, Louis is just such a lovely, caring little boy. And he's a little boy who will never forget his daddy. It's always heartbreaking to acknowledge how loss impacts on all of our lives. Every single one of you out there now will have a moment where we talk about loss and you connect. But when we're talking about traumatic loss of young people who are themselves parents, it almost amplifies the reality because you see so many shades of separation and shades of trauma and shades of loss. And for me to know that this is a little child who's out there wondering what's happened to his daddy, and it was so avoidable. Cases like this really remind me of how some people's egos can be so inflated and so delusionally large when you consider who they are that in the end it can usurp any sense or reason. Hatry was angry and he was vengeful and the consequences when he was under the influence were as we've talked about today. But certainly as far as I am concerned, Callum was abandoned by people who should have cared for him. And the family will live with that forever. I'd love to know your thoughts and your feelings on this case. I also hope that I've given legacy to somebody who cannot tell their own story. Leave me a like, leave me a comment. Please leave a comment for the family. They feel that Callum has been dragged through the mud and has no way of speaking his truth anymore. He's been silenced. The family know, as I said, that just like most children and young people, Callum was not an angel at times, but he'd really started to get his life together. And it feels painful that there is a stain on his reputation that cannot be healed unless his story is told and told loudly. I hope I have given volume to this loss. Take care guys. Lots of love to Callum's family, particularly to Louis. Take care, be safe.